I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. My guest on today's show is Muthu Muthaya, the Chief Investment Officer of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, one of the largest pediatric clinical care providers in the U.S. Muthu stewards CHOA's $6 billion long-term pool of capital, arriving a year ago after stints across a range of allocator seats over the past 20 years. Our conversation covers Muthu's mobile upbringing, path to finance, and lessons learned working for a range of asset owners. We discuss his first CIO seat at Inatai, where he oversaw a $2 billion portfolio, starting with a clean sheet of paper, and his new seat at CHOA, including the portfolio framework, team structure, and aspiration to achieve concentration, search for inefficiency, and invest in innovation. Before we get going, episode two on season three of Private Equity Deals releases this week. Season three focuses on a tiny slice of the massive middle market for deal-making. On this episode, we get a deal within a deal. Greg Fleming from Rockefeller Capital Management discusses both the buyout that created RCM and the tuck-in acquisitions of high-quality private wealth advisors that's formed the growth engine that's taken RCM to north of $100 billion in assets in the five years since he became CEO. On this season, we won't be posting teaser drops on the Capital Allocators feed, so subscribe to Private Equity Deals on your favorite podcast player to learn about the middle market from the players in the arena. And while you're at it, your most capitalist friend no doubt wants to learn how the money machine operates, so feel free to tell them about Private Equity Deals too. Thanks so much for spreading the word. Please enjoy my conversation with Muthu Muthai. Mutu, thanks for joining me. Good to be here, Ted. Why don't you take me back all the way to your childhood? I was born in India, and then when I was about three, we moved as a family to Australia, and then to Papua New Guinea, and then I moved back to India in grade 11 and 12 and went to college there. I grew up traveling a lot. Growing up that way, I think for myself, established my biases towards people. I always had to go to a new place and figure out the people and try to fit in and go to a new place again and try to figure out the culture and the people and try to fit in. People became a big bias for me. And that ended up college-wise me doing hospitality management as an undergrad because I was like, I like this people aspect of things. How did you find your way from hospitality management into finance? First, I found myself way outside of hospitality management. I graduated. I worked in the hotel business in India for two years. And I really didn't enjoy it. It wasn't what I had expected. So I quit. And my parents were very happy about that. And I took a year off and I moved back home and really just traveled a little bit in India, saw friends, but really thought about what I wanted to do next and talked to a lot of people. And that time, my brother had just graduated with a computer science degree in the University of Oregon. And way back when, my dad got a master's degree at UNC. Both of them were like, hey, how about if you switch careers, you think about an MBA and think about doing it in the States and graduate degrees for us both were an enjoyable thing in the States. I took them up on that, took my GMAT and ended up getting into a school called Rollins College, a small school in Orlando, Florida. And getting a scholarship was important to me and they were good with financial aid. So I found myself in Florida. And the first year, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do still. I was exploring my options. But I ended up getting an internship at the state of Florida's pension fund and working for a guy called Jim Trainer, who ran the private equity department and just fell in love with it. I was like, this is what I want to do. And how do I find myself back in this seat? So I graduated. I went out to the West Coast and worked for a really small investment bank for about eight, nine months or so, which I think gave me good fundamentals. And then Jim calls and he's like, hey, we have a slot open. Would you be interested in coming back? I just jumped on it. I moved from Southern California back to Tallahassee. 
I spent three years with Jim. At that point, we'd also gotten more allocation towards private. So we we're allocating more capital. I was learning a lot and it was an incredible amount of fun. And that's how I got back into the asset management world. How did you learn in those early years about what you were looking for in the private markets? Honestly, I had no idea, I think is the answer. There was all this dogma that existed and everything was conceptual, but it was about getting the reps. And in that three-year period, it was such a great platform to see so many things. And I began to crystallize how private equity worked and what we're looking for in general. But I, over the years, I feel like I've gotten more clarity. I don't know if it's the right kind of clarity, but early on, 27, yeah, I had no clue, honestly. What are some of those things that you've grown to having more clarity about in those markets? When we're looking at managers, it feels like we're looking for managers with edge at the end of the day. And if you were to broadly say that you have behavioral edge, analytical edge, relationship edge, information edge, and execution edge, all of those exist in private markets. You can pull all of those levers. And what I realized was it was about figuring out if people had the tools and the skill sets to be able to consistently pull those levers and seeing, hey, how do you use your behavioral edge to stay invested longer or stay away from things? How do you analyze something better than another private equity firm? How do you really show up in relationships, even when you're consummating the transaction and after the transaction? It felt, again, you're going to be partners with somebody for like seven years to build a business. There's a way to transact the front end of that in terms of building the relationship. What do you do with your information? And importantly, how do you execute? What does your playbook look like? How's it gotten better over time? How do you buy, build, sell? How did you decide to leave Florida? I did want to make my way to the endowment world at some point. And a lot of it being the nature of the capital is just so different. It's infinite investment horizon lower dependence on the pool for operations, variable spend rate, more unconstrained way to invest. So I did at some point want to make my way there. And I was really lucky through my network and ended up speaking to Srini Pulhorthy and Rob Blanford at the University of Richmond, better known as Spider Management, and made my way there and spent seven and a half years there, actually, which was the most I've spent in any one place and was able to learn a lot. What do you think were the most important things you learned working there? I was more of a single asset class person. I spent most, if not all of my time on private equity and pretty much large market private equity. So it was a very focused thing. And when I got there, it was a smaller team and you had to really think across asset classes, even if you were focused on one asset class. Rob and Trini always did a great job of challenging why making an investment in a certain bucket as opposed to other things that existed there. And that was my biggest learning to try to think across asset classes. How did you evolve in your seven years there, your roles, responsibilities? So I started on the private equity book and then took responsibility for a little bit more venture, a little bit more real estate. And then I really wanted to get cross asset class generalist type exposure. And so I put my hand up to be the emerging markets analyst. Rob was great and gave me that opportunity. So at the tail end of it, it evolved to all asset classes in emerging markets. After seven years, you must have been getting antsy given all of the movements you had as a kid. So what was the impetus for moving on from Spider? It was personal. I found myself 38 at that point, single, unmarried, and I wanted to go to a bigger city was the real answer. And I loved working for Rob and with the team and told people when I got there, I had seven colleagues. When I left, I had seven friends and it's hard to leave that. But I wanted to think about my personal life too. So the move precipitated because I wanted to be in a bigger city. And what'd you do? I went to Houston. I got an opportunity to work with a firm called Covariance Capital that was a subsidiary of TIA Craft. And it was an outsourced CIO establishment. And that took me to Houston for a little under three years and mostly focused on private markets across all private market strategies. What'd you find that was different doing the same work in an OCIO as compared to sort of an endowment office? I think the the balance between taking portfolio volatility and business volatility. It's in the back of your mind, or at least as an institution, it's a balance that needs to happen. Translates to a lot of our managers too. How much portfolio vol can you take before clients start to head for the door? And I think that balance was very much at the forefront. What is the appropriate amount? How did that play out? It can play out in taking less risk than you're supposed to be taking. I don't think that played out at Covariance that way. We took the appropriate amount of risk for our clients, but a large part of that was also a big bulk of the AUM was TIA. 
So there was a lot more stability in the business. So you had a normal stint for you, say three years there. How about the next move? From Covariance, it was back to the endowment fold. I got an opportunity to work at Emory for Mary Cahill, who hired me to run private markets there with a two-person team. So that brought me back to Atlanta. And that portfolio was really a joy to work on. We repositioned it back to being a smaller market private equity focus and a little bit more early stage in the venture side too. What did you see that was different at Emory from maybe Spider or Covariance or both? Probably a lot more similarities than not in terms of the model was executed the same way, but a little bit larger in terms of manager count than the other places that I'd worked. So how did you find your way from the focus on private markets to the CIO seat? I've thought about it. It feels to me that we do four things fundamentally, where to invest money, who to invest money with, how much to give them. And we think about risk management on top of all of that. And it's said in other terms, asset allocation, manager selection, portfolio construction, and risk management. And I thought in the manager selection on like who to give money to. And I realized over time that even if I was thinking about giving money to private equity folks, I could make better decisions if I knew about what it takes to give money to other folks. So the first move was to say, hey, I think I could just be better at this if I had more exposure to other things. And that helped me think about the other aspects of what we do, portfolio construction and asset allocation. So it was somewhat of an evolution there. And the final step is, do you want to take those four things and be the bridge to governance? And I thought long and hard about that because it's a lot of fun doing those four things. At the end of the day, not the governance isn't. But I thought that was an evolution that I wanted to make, so was actively looking for those opportunities. So I landed at what is now called Inatai Foundation, but started life as Group Health Foundation in Seattle, Washington. It was a $2 billion AUM philanthropy focused on health equity. What was it like when you were first in that CIO seat? Between Emory and Inatai Foundation, I took about a month off, and I remember calling Neil Aronson at Rourke in Atlanta to let Neil know that I was making the move, and, and he was very encouraging. And I said, look, the place I'm going to is a clean slate. There's no team. There's no active portfolio yet. It's liquidity waiting to get invested. And I said, you've built this business, and do you have any advice for me as I go into this in terms of how to build something from the ground up? And he gave me really, really good advice. He said, one of my favorite quotes is a Mark Twain quote where he says, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. And he said, I encourage you to take time off if you can, to read a lot, to listen a lot, and then really try to refine what you want to do and how you do it and how you communicate it, and that should serve you. And so I did that, and I listened to a lot of Capital Allocator podcasts. So I took that, <laughs> I took that month off, I read as much as I could. And I would literally take a walk every day and listen to one podcast. And it's just an absolute treasure trove because you get to listen to people like Scott Malpass and Larry Cochard and just these eminent investors that are just sharing all these treasures with you. And it was amazing. So that made me feel a little bit more confident about the transition. So when I got there, I think I was able to maybe communicate a little bit more clearly on where things needed to go and how we needed to build. So did you step into the seat $2 billion of cash to put to work. Not many people have that chance to do it with a clean slate. How did you go about doing it? So I initially thought it felt like building a house. You need a foundation or you need a framework on top of that to drive things. And foundationally, what you needed was strong governance, really good resources, access to great managers, and aligned investment team. So we thought about building that as the foundation. And we were lucky to recruit some amazing people. So uh, Pang Wang, who is the CIO there now, Charlotte Tsang, Julia Riley, Don Wilson, we all built it together, Ted, but we got the foundation right. And then framework-wise, we kind of stepped back and said, look, you know, we're here to provide performance, but performance is an outcome, and it's an outcome of apt investment philosophy, operationalized by a rigorous process, and run by aligned people. So that's the framework we hung on top of everything and built from there on those three pillars. How did you get the governance set up so that it was effective and allowed you to do that focus on the process and the people? So where we spent most of our time was communication, 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 transparency, transparency, transparency. 
in that time that I took off between the two jobs, I was also lucky to get connected with a whole bunch of people that were already CIOs through my friend Rahul Mudgol, who knows everybody in the world, apparently. And so he put me in touch with great people and I was able to just show up and say, hey, I'm doing this for the first time. You've done it before. And I just love to learn about how to think about these things. Jim Dunn at Verger, he said, hey, get to know everybody, get to know all the stakeholders. It's not just your investment committee. It's not just your leadership. It's everybody. And that served me really well. And then Jack Mailer at Cystic Fibrosis Foundation said, look, we're all used to speaking a certain language, but what is useful is to listen and figure out what language the organization speaks and then contextualize those things in that language. And that was incredible advice. So when I got to Inatai, I listened a lot and the language was equity and inclusion and representation and all of those things and that the pool of capital is there to provide ammunition for that. We contextualize things in that lens, which was really, really helpful. And then when you think about children's RAM now, it's the language that's spoken is goals and performance and measurement. So when we can provide those things, the conversation goes forward. At Inatai, you've had all these different experiences going in. How did you decide to structure the portfolio? It's kind of the same thing that we use in children's now. And we thought about asset allocation first and about what we're trying to accomplish there and how we're trying to accomplish it. We started off with two large asset class buckets, equity-like investments there to compound capital and then credit fixed income-like investments there to provide you low correlation to equities and liquidity. So those are the two buckets that we thought about broadly. And we said, look, if you take away the specific asset class buckets, which all own equity on the equity side of things, but they have different reporting frequencies, valuation methodologies, you're changing the question you ask. So if you think in buckets, it feels like you're asking the question of how to own something, which is a very valid question and should be answered. But if you take away the buckets wholesale, you're forced to ask the question of what to own. And that feels like a question we could answer with more clarity because we knew the nature of our pool of capital. Given we can take a whole lot more volatility and a whole lot more illiquidity and we have longer duration, we want to own long duration, high quality assets that are sourced in inefficient markets and benefit from innovation. How did you take that vision of the most important things in what to own and put it into an implementation of a portfolio? On the quality piece of it all, the notion is that the end game is quality. So in public markets, we try to align ourselves with managers who we thought could buy quality either in structurally inefficient markets or doing inefficient windows. And then in the private portfolio, our notion was to align ourselves with managers that, for lack of a better term, manufacture quality. So how does the notion of quality dovetail with innovation and inefficiency? On the innovation edge, if you've ever read Baklav Schmel, one of his books, he categorizes innovation into four big buckets of tools machines, materials, and methods. And when we thought about innovation, we thought about it pretty broadly to say that there can also be innovation in method, there can also be innovation in things around the edges. So not just looking for innovation that looks like tech, innovation that looks like business model innovation in China or India or the markets or even companies evolving. AI is tech, but AI right now. So that's how we thought about how innovation fit into the portfolio but also a way of saying it's about different rates of growth, either tech-enabled high growth or better process-enabled lower growth, but growth at the end of the day. And quality for us seemed like moated growth. I'm curious about this quality notion, because usually you think of a quality, say, public market, a high-quality business. You don't think about inefficiency. Or if anything, you think about being expensive. And then when you think about innovation, that seems like you're more on the venture end of things than existing high quality cash flow compounding businesses. So how did those two things fit together? You're right. So I think the way we'd express it then in the portfolio is on the public equity side of the market it is a focus on quality, which we might pay a little bit more for, but if we can hang in for longer duration, it would work. And the private end of things, expressing the building of quality through value investments in private equity or growth through venture capital. When you have just the equity-like and the credit fixed income-like buckets, how do you decide how to size 
public equity, private equity, public credit, private credit, whatever else might fit in. It gives us an equity beta target of 0.7, and we allocate that across managers and try to manage it to the 0.7. Within public and liquid realms, we look at actual beta, and then within private realm, we look at an assumed beta. And we think about assumed beta in the private side of about 1.4, and then measure the beta of our public equity and liquid managers and construct the portfolio that way. Sizing-wise, we look very specifically at what is the risk-return profile of each of the strategies that we're putting in the portfolio, what's the liquidity that we're taking on, and where is the firm and its evolution. So we have some pretty broad strokes on where that ends up, Ted. So we generally target about a 50 basis point allocation per fund to venture managers, usually about a 1% allocation per fund for private equity managers, and a 3 to 5% allocation for more liquid managers, and then adjust those as time goes by. But if you think about our allocations broadly, we have a 40% target to privates. So that leaves us 30% in public equities, 30% in the more defensive type portfolio. So if we sized each one of our public equity managers at about 3%, that's about 10 managers for us, steady state. And then on the defensive side, it'll be 3% per managers. And the private's a little hotter, given AUM. And so we'd have more venture managers, given the scale of our AUM and how much we can get per fund. That'll be about 30 or so. We'll circle around the 50 number. Once you develop that framework in the modern era with lots of pools of capital like yours in different ways in the various places you worked. What was it like taking a fresh pool of cash and putting it to work from scratch? It was scary because we had to time it all, or at least talk a lot about how we're not timing it all and that we're finding the right investments and putting them to work. We lucked out, I think, in that we were putting the money to work with managers right through the COVID pandemic. So we really benefited from timing. But our biggest worry, I think, Ted, was what is the timing going to look like on this in terms of getting invested? Once you build this out over a couple of years, you've now taken everything you've learned, put it into a portfolio from scratch, and you've built this house. I'm scratching my head and how you ended up not living in it for very long. (laughs) It was a really, really, really tough decision because working with people that you love, four people work together building something, you get really, really close. So It was hard to leave those folks and really hard to leave the mission too. But for me personally, Atlanta was a better fit for me. I spent a lot of my time in the South and had built a network of friends and not from the US, so friends become family. So moving back to the East Coast was a big pull, but also the mission at Children's. So I work for an organization whose mission is to make kids better today and healthier tomorrow. And it's also meaningful in terms of doing it in your own community, because I take a lot of Ubers from the office when I have local meetings. And so many of the Uber drivers that I jump into when they pick me up at the office tell me about how their child was treated at Children's, to have the opportunity to work for a great mission, but a great mission that's in the community you live in. Once you arrive at Children's, the hospital system, different operating setup than endowment foundation. How did you think about the investment program as integrating with the hospital business. Yeah, going back to those fundamentals of communication and transparency, a very close connection to the operation so we know what the needs of the hospital are was the main focus. I'd say one difference that I've noticed is that people on the hospital side of things have to react to economic realities a lot quicker, given what they do and how complex it is and pushing costs through and reimbursement. The conversations around Volatility are a lot different. They inherently understand volatility because they go through operation volatility so much, which was different from the other places that I'd worked. But I think the nature of the capital is pretty similar. So how we put it to work is pretty similar. What did you find when you showed up in terms of the structure of the portfolio? So we had more sub-asset classes. And so the first notion we did is work on those three buckets of philosophy, process, and people. And we worked on collapsing our asset class buckets. So we did that to mirror the notion of an allocation to equity-like and an allocation to fixed income-like. And the second part of that, when the buckets go away, there's certain investments that go away. So the second part of that was consolidating the portfolio, which 12 months in, we took our liquid equity-like portfolio from somewhere around 35 managers to 12. So we're running a fairly concentrated portfolio now. 
and then structuring the team from being siloed to being generalist so that they could focus on a smaller number of managers, but also focus across asset classes. How did you do that manager pruning process from 35 to 12 on the public side? The first thing I'll say is all the managers that we were invested in have done tremendous things for children. So we're all grateful for what they've done for the organization. But it started with philosophy. So our equity benchmark is MSCI Acqui. So we say, look, at the end of the day, for us to outperform that, we need to take risks, that big buckets of risks that aren't in it. And so looking at that, we say, look, the big buckets of risks to take are concentration, illiquidity, leverage, and timing. So on the concentration part, that for us evolved into portfolio construction, having a more concentrated portfolio, and also being in places where we see inefficiency. On the illiquidity side was where a lot of cross-asset class thinking happened. That we like illiquidity with control. And so markets where small cap US equities, for example, or very small cap, deep distress, deep value stuff that was in the portfolio had a place in the portfolio if you weren't doing buyouts. And that the buyout allocation, because we don't have the buckets, consumed some of that more deep value, small cap stuff. So those are the two things that we use to concentrate the portfolio at the top down level. And then the bottom up level, it was the same thing that we applied to ourselves, which is what is the manager's philosophy? What are their processes? What do their people look like? And re-underwriting all of them. I want to pull apart each of those four levers. You start with concentration. There's the pruning that leads to a more concentrated number of managers. That may or may not be the same as what you own. How did you think about concentration as it relates to what assets you own? The concentration took us to places thematically where we thought there was an efficiency in innovation. So we went more concentrated into China, more into India, more into technology disruption per se, and then more into life sciences. That was the top-down thematic concentration. And then focusing on managers themselves that were fairly concentrated. And did you do that across public and private markets? We did. On the private markets, there's not much movement, but I classified folks as to legacy and core. So in each of those, there's different dynamics. I'd love to pull apart. You start in India, your home country. What did you find when you decided you want to have some concentrated investments in India? Getting concentrated on the public equity side because of valuations in terms of where we started that concentration process was a challenge to say, no, do we want to, at this point in the cycle, put more money into India? And how that evolved for us was to spend time in places or in pockets of India where we thought valuations were somewhat more reasonable. So early stage VC was probably one of those areas where we spent a little bit more time. But we had two investment managers that are already focused on India going into the portfolio, which we have kept and tried to size up given we think they hold some stuff that's a little different from others. What did you find about the community of managers focusing in India when you looked? Yeah, on the public market side, there was a lot of ownership of the same things. Not a lot of differentiation in people's portfolios, except on the margins. And then on the private side, we thought about what are we trying to do in the Indian context? We didn't spend a lot of time in the buyout world at all, mostly because we think Western developed markets are a great place to be in the buyout world. And in the venture world, we did spend a lot of time and it felt to us that there's been really good evolution in the type of manager in India, in venture, which looks like the US a lot now in terms of the type of person who finds himself at a venture fund. And it used to be investment bankers or transaction experience, and it became consultants with business experience. And now you see former founders at firms, which feels like it's evolving the same way the US evolved. So top down the three big buckets, that's what we noticed. How did you think about concentrating in China? China does offer inefficiency and innovation, but then you also have to layer on top of that the risks of binary capital loss or regulation and all of those things. So where we came to was to say, let's concentrate with managers who we think are good at navigating the regulatory environment, who are aware of it, who know where the backwind is and where it's not. So when we had confidence that managers on the ground were better at navigating that, we allocated more to them. But any of our allocations don't grow top down, they grow bottom up. So as far as we can get comfortable finding more people like that, we'll do more things in China. 
How do you consider the changes in the geopolitical context between the U.S. and China with those investments? We think about it a lot, and where it's come out for us is that we've gotten a lot more liquid in China. So we've not really spent a lot of time on illiquid investments. We're not quite sure the illiquidity premium is there for all the risks that we're bearing, but we're still confident that there's equity premium in the market. So we've just gotten a lot more liquid. So when you turn to healthcare and technology, you've had very different dynamics, particularly in the public markets over the last couple of years. How have you thought about investing in both of those sectors? On the tech side of things, we think most of our exposure will come from the venture portfolio. And on the life science side of things, we spent a lot of time thinking about private versus public. And so where we're expressing the life science view now is in the public markets. And the reason for that is when we look at venture in life sciences, and there's a broad statement, this is not, doesn't cover everybody, but the strategy seems to be to invest in a platform that has multi-molecule outcomes. And in that construct, dollar that goes to a company, it seems like 60 cents goes to building infrastructure and 40 cents goes to R&D. So not super capital efficient in terms of what they're building. And then by the time liquidity comes, it's based on the success of one molecule, which the private fund gets to participate in. And then the other four molecules are up for grabs for public equity investors who seem to be doing a great job at that. When we thought about those dynamics, it didn't feel to us that we needed to take a liquidity in the life science market. So we ended up and are a lot more public in life sciences than we are private. And in that market where there's lots of winners and losers, how have you thought about long only versus hedge funds? We've done mostly long short in the space. And our notion on long short generally has been that we want to be in long short managers where we think that they're operating in a fertile shorting market where there's clear catalysts and there's clear dispersion in stock performance and science is a clear catalyst. In tech, you mentioned mostly in venture and yet any investment you have in the public markets in the US, if it's benchmarked, it's seven tech companies that are driving the index. So how have you thought about balancing those two, your public market exposure that may not fit into these themes, but ultimately today is going to be benchmarked against technology? There's a mismatch for us on the public side, which we are comfortable with. And so we have global managers that have exposure to U.S. tech and tech broadly, where they think the inefficient windows have opened up and they're able to get in. We do have some exposure. I wouldn't say it matches the public index, so we are mismatched. So the way we think about it is to say, on the growth spectrum of things, especially in tech, let's take the exposure in our private market portfolio which means that our portfolio won't keep up with big rallies in the market and won't have as much momentum. But we think over market cycles, if we get the private stuff right, we'll outperform the benchmark. In the context of everything you're doing, how big can each of these themes get relative to your total assets? We think about sizing on these themes in different matrices. So if you thought about China, it's about 16% of global GDP right now. So that feels like a number to think about for us, not to target, but to think about in terms of our exposures in general. Within tech, it is a bottoms-up portfolio. Most of it for us will come from our venture side of things. And we think venture will be about 50% of our private portfolio, which is a target of 40, so probably about 20% in the venture portfolio. And then on India, I think we're about 5% now in Indian exposure. And again, if you thought about GDP, could get a little bigger than where it is right now, but it's really is dependent on the entry point and finding the right managers. And then with life sciences, completely bottoms up, Ted. We've got, I think, 6% or so of the book in life sciences right now. If you move on to liquidity and illiquidity, how do you think about your budgets for how much you can lock up? So when we decide on the 40% number on the 10 plus year illiquid type structures, it came from thinking about our ability to rebalance. So we didn't want more than 40 would not allow us to rebalance when we wanted to. And then we thought about unfunded liabilities. So saying, look, at the end of the day, unfunded liabilities and the commitments you make are contractual and callable, so they're leverage, and we don't want too much leverage in the portfolio. And so about 20% was what we were comfortable with in terms of leverage, which if you think about the ratio of unfunded to NAV results in about a 40% illiquid investment. And then on a yearly basis, we try to commit no more than 6% of the AUM to illiquids. 
so that we don't bust through that 20% unfunded. You mentioned leverage. How do you think about using leverage as a tool in your portfolio? We don't at the portfolio level, but I think the way it's expressed in the portfolio with leverage and timing is private equity and hedge funds. How do you think about timing? We don't think about timing, but we do have managers that think about timing, and that's delegated timing, (laughs) I'd put it as, in the private equity portfolio with the five-year commitment period and being able to time that, and then with the net exposures on the hedge fund side. How do you work in some of the other assets we haven't talked about that are available? Certain real assets, real estate, timber, in this framework of equity-like and fixed income-like? When you think about the equity side of things and the illiquid equity side of things, we're saying, hey, we want an equity premium, we want a liquidity premium, and we want diversification if we can get it. So when you think about real estate within the realm of competing against venture and buyout, it's hard for us to get there. And given our liability streams, et cetera, we don't need a lot of yield, I think, at this point in time. So we don't do core. If real estate does make it into the portfolio, it's usually opportunistic. It's usually small, high vacancy development things. Right now, we don't have any. And then on the real asset exposure, given we do have 70% of our assets in equity-like investments, we're comfortable with that serving as protection for long-term inflation. So even in the real asset world, I think we need to see real equity premiums evolve and strategies that are less dependent on just price, which is hard for us to come by. How do you fill the exposures to the fixed income and credit-like exposures? So given our duration, we want to be as much in equity as possible, but to solve for short-term volatility. And so right now, that portfolio has exposure to distressed credit, which we've built slowly over the last couple of months and waiting, I'd say, for lack of a better term. And then it has more of our very low net, long short folks, fixed income and cash. So it's a pretty simple portfolio I define it as and serves that function again of providing us both illiquidity and defensiveness. So in that portfolio, we don't tend to do a lot of illiquid stuff. When you roll up the exposures you've picked up bottom up, somewhat top down from your themes, how do you think about the overall risk? The risks that we control for are really three, market risk, illiquidity, and manager risk. So on the market risk side, we simplistically pay attention to equity beta. So moving equity beta up and down through redemptions and allocations on the portfolio. So on the illiquidity side, again, the regulator being not more than 6% of the portfolio in illiquid investments in any given year. And then on the manager selection side, hopefully doing great deep due diligence. What does your due diligence process look like for a manager? I don't think it looks dissimilar from a lot of our peers. We've all been doing manager selection for a long time, but we tend to focus on unpacking the three pillars. What is your philosophy? And definitionally, is it the same as ours? So if you're saying you run a concentrated portfolio, but you have 50 names, we might have a definitional mismatch on what it means to be concentrated. So it's things like that on the philosophy to say, does their philosophy align with our philosophy and do we define things the same way? Process-wise, really looking for repeatability, rigor, collaborativeness among the team. And then on the people side, looking first and foremost for alignment. I think our folks aligned with us and then spending time on culture. So I think those are the broad strokes of what we look for. Alignment's a funny one. And People can define it in different ways with a very, very similar concept. What have you found has worked best in the weeds of what makes a manager aligned with you? I think economic alignment is an easy one to get to. How much are they invested alongside you is an easy one and a box that we check. And besides that, it's spending time with folks trying to figure out what drives them. Because are they motivated to keep performing? And you like to say, do they think about this as a sport? And do they want to be the best at that sport? And then thirdly, that our mission is important to them, that they care about what we care about, and they're aligned to care about the kids of Georgia, as we do. And if those three things match up, I think that's what we look for. What are the aspects of culture that you found conducive to success for a manager? Debate is critical to be able to get to the right decisions. That implies more collaboration amongst team members. And then I also think culture feels like what people talk about. And when you spend time with people and they're talking about investments, even when you're at dinner with them and just obsessing over the portfolio, that's a clear indication for us of what matters at the firm. 
versus having dinner and talking about a whole lot of other things. And I know that's a very fuzzy thing to say, but it's a combination of those things. And also for us, it feels like thinking about the attributes of the folks in the team and the values they share together. And we generally try to tease out, is there humility? Are they curious? Values-wise, do they operate as a team? Do they care about excellence? If you think about a recent decision you made, either to include someone in your portfolio or to not include them, what were the toughest aspects of that one decision that you have in mind? That's a good question. It's actually a decision we haven't made yet that's still rolling around with the team in that the dissonance between what people say and what they do. And on paper, this manager says all the right things. We're long-term oriented. We do deep work. We don't play momentum, all of these things. And then you look at the results and they don't quite stack up to the behavior that they purport to. So that's been a tough decision, I think. And it's a decision in the work still. As you built out the structure of this portfolio in your image, and then look to enhance on the margin. I'm curious, what are the things beyond a roster of managers that you're implementing or would like to? As we define our objectives to deliver on top of the benchmark, to make sure that we're providing for today's spending, compounding capital, one thing that we try to think about is being the best manager in our portfolio of managers. And I think we will never get there and we shouldn't ever get there but it's an element of learning from the folks that we're invested with and seeing what we could bring over. It translates into working on our processes and making sure that we refine them over and over and over again and going back and doing analyses on what worked, what didn't, what was skill, what was luck, where should we go, where shouldn't we go? And it's taking a page from Alpine Investors out in San Francisco, Graham Weaver, where he says, We try consistently to water the flowers and take out the weeds. And that's a part of what we try to do too, to look back and say, what could have we done better? What didn't we get right? What did we get right process-wise? And then people-wise, it's about growth for everybody. We've all been in places where people want to grow. And so constantly thinking about where people can grow within the team. I think the generalist model works very well for that in terms of people have their bias and they've spent time in one place, but they grow and learn more in another place. How have you thought about internal capabilities? You've got manager selection, now you have a whole world to co-invest. Sometimes people do some passive strategies internally. We're aware of what our skill sets are, and our skill sets are picking managers. And then we try to think about how do we leverage the other things we can do, but coming from our core competency, which is manager selection. So how that translates is into co-investments, We've been thinking a lot about fundless sponsors in today's market, mostly because it solves for private equity exposure without the unfunded commitment leverage, and as does co-investments. So for us, it's more driven by solving for unfunded than fees. Our skill sets are analyzing managers. Our skill sets are figuring out what a core investment looks like for a manager and what their strike zone is. So when we look at co-investments, we think about it as a, does this asset fit the manager analysis? So coming from knowing the manager first, and we have a four-tier process where we say, hey, is this allocation to this sector or country something that we're interested in? Does it fit the strike zone of the manager? Are the models reasonable? How do we size it? Pull the thread a bit on fundless sponsors and how you're thinking about that. When you look at new funds that are formed in the private equity space, There was a period of time where fundraising was a lot easier than it is today. And in that period, you could come from a very big brand name private equity firm and raise your first fund without much of a problem. That might not be available in today's market. So as people think about proving their track record, it feels like there's a place for us to participate there. And we went back and looked at successful fundless sponsor track records pre-fund one. So we're invested with Diversus, which came out of Marlin. The deals that they did between Marlin and forming Diversus were extraordinary, honestly. So there's just so much alignment. Somebody who's in mid-career willing to put that career progression at a great firm on pause to prove their own thing has an amount of hunger that doesn't exist in other places, especially when you're a fundless sponsor and you have to raise it deal by deal. And what we noticed then was that because people don't have this unfunded commitment clock ticking on them, they wait for pretty fat pitches because if they don't get the fat pitch, then they don't raise fund one. So as we look at that, we said, look, it feels like a good place to look for returns. 
but what are we looking for specifically, or at least what's our first level screen before we get to defining strike zone. And the way we think about it is folks that have been at a firm where they were deal leads cradle to grave, so they had real impact on the portfolio. They have returns that we can somehow triangulate through reference calls or whatever it might be. And they want to build a firm at some point in time, not remain fundless sponsors for the rest of their careers. If you put on your cap of thinking about inefficiency and innovation in your portfolio, I'm wondering if you could turn that to your investment efforts with your team and the market that you're participating in. And maybe first, where do you see the potential to take advantage of what you perceive as inefficiencies in the way capital gets allocated to managers? One thing that seems sexy, I guess, but is hard to figure out is how tech plays a part in all of this and all of what we do. How can tech enable us to just be better manager selectors? And some of the things that come to mind are APIs into LinkedIn so that we're not waiting to hear from a manager if somebody left and we can actually figure out if somebody's leaving. It feels like there's a lot you could do tech-enabled wise, and I think the LP community maybe has been slower at it. It also is a matter of attracting the right talent to get it done. I'm not sure the best data science person or AI person is going to want to come and work for an allocator. And then on the innovation side, everyone's always looking for the next frontier of investing. I would love to hear any thoughts you have of where you're considering poking around. For us, fundless sponsors seems like some part of the next frontier. That's where we've concentrated most, if not all of our work in terms of things that we don't do today. So you're one year in. If we sat down again a year or two or three from now, what are you hoping to accomplish over these next couple of years within your portfolio? Yeah, I think it's just refinement and getting the paces and building the culture. There's a transition that happens when you go from a siloed world to a generalist world. And that transition happens better if you can build a climate of trust, that you can build a climate of collaboration. So I hope when we talk a year from now, I can say we built that culture that works. And when I think about the whole construct of philosophy, process, and people, it feels like philosophy and process is hardware and people is software. And if you're running the wrong operating system, it just doesn't matter. So in a year, hopefully we'll get the operating system right. I want to make sure I have a little time to ask you a couple closing questions. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Probably about five years ago, I bought a motorbike. So I do that, which I really love. And so spending my college days in India, motorbikes are a part of what you do. But I was riding 150 cc small bikes that were probably mopeds. And I got myself a little bit of a bigger bike and I love doing that. What's your biggest pet peeve? With people in general and with investors more specifically too, it's a lack of humility and it's dismissiveness. All of us have a skill set. Sometimes the market cooperates and sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get unlucky. People are good at talking about when they were unlucky, but not great about talking about when they were lucky. So that humility to say, hey, I got this right, but it could have gone the other way keeps you evolving. And the dismissiveness part of it really gets to me too. If there's an idea, give it some consideration before you blow it off. What investment mistake have you made that you'll never make again? I mean, plenty. The one that I got the most learning from was when I was at Spider, we made an investment in an Indian infrastructure private equity fund, which didn't work out so well. And when I went back and thought about my analysis, I was just like dead sure this thing would work because there was a power investments in the fund and thematically it felt like, oh, look, demand wise, India has a lot of demand for power, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of infrastructure to provide it. Oh, great theme. And the second step was, well, they have purchasing power, purchasing contracts, prices are set in, how could this go wrong? And then it all went wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> how did it go wrong? The contracts ended up being an Achilles heel because tariffs on coal went up and they were caught in the middle there. Then the team started to leave and all the things that you don't want to happen, happened. And as I think back on that, the lessons for me are, themes are great, but you got to still pick investments. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Honestly, I thought about this one and there's just so many people that have had, so I'm going to basically give you all of them. So people that stand out for me, like Jim Trainer, who hired me at the state of Florida, it was my first allocator investment job. He was such an example of just how to be a person in this world. Good, decent person, thoughtful. And then Rob Blanford at Spider, because Rob was willing to help me get from being a siloed person to a generalist person and willing to 
sit down and talk to me about how to think about those things. And the next transition for me was going from being an asset class person to a chief investment officer and trying to figure out how governance works and all of those things. I was really lucky because in a Thai foundation, our IC chair, Peter Van Oppen, really helped me with that, as did our CEO, Nicole Marr. And then when I thought about this question, I first thought about people that I reported to, but there's a bunch of people that reported to me that I've learned a ton from. And Pong at Inatai really stands out. He's one of the brightest people I've worked with. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? So my parents aren't the type to sit you down and teach you. And so it was all looking at how they acted as people. And what I know about my parents as I was growing up, they treated people well and they stood up for what they believed in. And for me, the teaching from that was to say, be kind, but also have a backbone. All right, with the last one, what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? This is also from five years ago. So five years is a pivotal point for me in my history. But in that month that I took off and I was doing all the reading, I kept running into the concept again of your circle of competence. And it got me thinking about there's more circles in life. There's a circle of competence, which is what you know. There's a circle of skill, which is what you know how to do. And there's a circle of joy, which is what you actually enjoy. And it felt to me that life was about making those three circles as big as possible and as concentric as possible. So I said, hey, taking all that together, what I want to do in life is I want to do something meaningful with people I care about. And that was a realization I had five years ago. And I wish I'd had that many, many years ago. Ruth, thanks so much for sharing your path and exciting new seat at CHOA. Thank you, Ted. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the show. To learn more, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can join our mailing list, access past shows, learn about our gatherings, and sign up for premium content, including podcast transcripts, my investment portfolio, and a lot more. Have a good one, and see you next time.